Well, thank you so much um, for coming. Can you all hear me in the last row? Yeah? Good. Um, it always feels a little bit like coming home, coming to Bartram's garden, so I'm very pleased to be here. But I thought I'm going to begin uh, telling you a little bit how I came to write this book, because um, I was born in India, I'm German, and I live in London, so some people might wonder how I dare to write about the American founding fathers, but uh, there's a logic behind it, so just bear with me. I came to write this book really by accident when I was researching and writing my last book, The Brother Gardeners, which is about the British obsession with gardens. And I would have never thought that that would lead me to write a book about the American founding fathers and gardens, because I had never thought of America as a gardening nation. And one of the reasons for that might be that my first impressions of America were shaped in 1987 when I went on a seven weeks road trip from Washington DC to San Francisco. And that road trip really confirmed every cliche a German teenager had in the late 1980s. I was in awe with the shopping malls and the drive throughs and colossal billboards. Um, but what really stayed with me the most was um, this, the roads that never seemed to cut and uh, the vast fields. So it felt almost like um, man had imposed this grid on nature. And even in suburban America, everything, everything seemed to be on a larger scale than what I was used to in Europe. So there were these big houses on large plots of land, not much gardening really, but a lot of lawn around it. So I thought of America as this larger than life kind of industrial city, uh, country really. And um, it was kind of further confirmed, I suppose, through me living in Britain, where everybody seemed to be obsessed with gardens. And uh, because this is what I was used to in Britain. This is actually the garden of my best British friend. And those of you who have um, heard, who've heard me talk about the brother gardens have seen this already, because I asked her then to send me a picture of her garden, and she sent me a CD with 132 <laughs> of them. So I promised her I'm going to show it again. So this is what I was used to in Britain. And in America, I thought I'm most likely to see this rather than someone pruning roses. But how wrong I was, because I think that America at its roots is as much a gardening nation as Britain is, just a little bit different. When I researched the Brother Gardeners, I not only discovered how important American trees and shrubs had been for the creation of the English garden, but also how important plants had been for the making of America. And one of the protagonists in the Brother Gardeners was John Bartram, who I don't have to explain very much here, I think, but uh, he's an 18th century American farmer and plant collector who lived here and who, from the 1730s, began to send boxes of seeds and plants over to England and over four decades completely changed the English landscape. And it was really through Bartram that I discovered this remarkable connection to the founding fathers and to the founding fathers and plants. He was a very good friend of Benjamin Franklin and it was actually through his connection um, with Benjamin Franklin and the library company in Philadelphia that he was put in contact with the English gardeners. But as I read on through letters and manuscripts and diaries and accounts, I came across, for example, an account of a visit of the delegates of the Constitutional Convention uh, in 1787 to Bartram's garden, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. And I found an invoice to uh, George Washington who had ordered hundreds of trees and shrubs for his garden in Mount Vernon. <coughs> James Madison had visited, um, John Adams had visited, and Jefferson had even found time to come here while he was writing the Declaration of Independence. And there's a rather romanticized depiction of George Washington visiting um, Bartram's garden. And you can see this is the kind of back of the house just over there. So, but it was only really when I followed John Bartram's footsteps uh, through the Appalachian Mountains in October 2006 that I understood just how important plants had been for the Founding Fathers. Because Bartram had gone plant hunting every autumn and very often he'd gone to the Appalachian Mountains. So I went down to the Shenandoah National Park and I looked at my map and I saw that 
Thomas Jefferson's Monticello was very nearby. And I thought, well, okay, I'll you know, stop there, have a look at the home of the writer of the Declaration of Independence. And this is Monticello. So, but when I came up to the mountaintop, I was just absolutely astounded because what I saw was really the work of a revolutionary gardener who had crafted his grounds as carefully as he had crafted his words. And Monticello brings together the vast beauty of America with the productivity of the land. And this combination of the, of the rugged and wild with the neat and useful, I think, is very uniquely American. And I think that Monticello can be read like a monument to Jefferson's <coughs> beliefs and his philosophy. And we can almost read it like his letters, I suppose. So in a way, John Bartram and Monticello became the inspiration of this book. So I realized that America's first four presidents um, had all used nature in one way or another in their fight for America. And for me, this was really a journey of many surprises and gave me a completely new perspective on the founding fathers. So there was um, George Washington, who I had known as the revolutionary hero, first president of the United States. But what I didn't know was that he was more likely to talk about trees and the merits of plows rather than about politics. Thomas Jefferson, once I'd seen Monticello, I realized just what a revolutionary gardener he was. And then there was James Madison, father of the Constitution, brilliant legal mind. But what I didn't know was that he's actually the forgotten father of American environmentalism because he tried to rally the Americans to protect nature and the forest. And then there was John Adams, American minister in Paris and in London, second president of the United States. What I didn't know was that he was also a passionate gardener, but that he also went on a garden tour uh, in England with Thomas Jefferson. And then another little slide of George Washington on his plantation. So all four of them really regarded themselves foremost as gardeners and as farmers and not as politicians. And when you actually read through their letters, you'll see that almost every single letter will mention at some stage seeds, gardens, harvest times, agricultural implements. They're just talking all the time about this and what they call their rural am amusements. So it's very much kind of part of their life. And their passion for plants, nature, gardens, and agriculture is deeply woven into the fabric of America and very much aligned with their political thoughts. So they didn't just create the United States in a political sense. They also understood the importance of plants for the making of this nation. And as such, we can look at golden cornfields and rows and rows of cotton plants as a symbol of America's economic independence from Britain. We can see towering trees as a reflection of a nation that is strong, young, independent, and fertile. Native species were imbued with patriotism and proudly planted in their gardens. And metaphors drawn from the natural world really brought plants into politics. So I think it is almost impossible to understand the making of the United States without looking at the Founding Fathers as gardeners and as farmers. And this is played out on many different levels. So the first and most obvious level is really the economic level. It's the importance of good agricultural crops for a country's self-sufficiency. Uh, it works on an ideological level, which is the Jeffersonian vision of America as an agrarian republic. It works in terms of national identity because America's spectacular landscape becomes very much uh, invested with patriotism. And it works literally and symbolically uh, because they all use their gardens as a canvas to paint or let's say to grow a political statement. But let me give you an example and let me take you to the summer of 1776. America's just declared independence Manhattan is an armed camp where soldiers drill in the streets. Uh, George Washington is the commander in chief. And New York is facing 30,000 British troops. This is the largest enemy fleet that has ever arrived on America's shores. 
Washington has about half the manpower. Uh, very few of